Welcome to the Aspire Conference. First of all, I need to apologise to you all. I got up to get the British Airways flight here yesterday, and by the time I'd landed in Krakow, I'd lost my voice. So I worked very hard last night, um, eating a lot of Polish honey and drinking a lot of tea, and uh, I can actually speak today, which is good news. Um, I love Krakow. I started coming here 20 years ago as a tourist, and I've seen this city change. It's changing in much the same way that London, the city I've worked in for the last 30 years, is changing. It's changing in much the same way as Scotland, the country I'm originally from, is changing. In that all of these countries, in the case of Poland, it was unlocked from communism. In the case of Britain, it was unlocked from its colonial past. And both places, both Poland and the United Kingdom, have been booming over the last 15 years. And it's been great to see. And Krakow really is a fantastic place to do business and work. That said, let me tell you the story of a company called Virgin. A company that did go the whole way, as they say. A company that I started working for when I was age 25, and I'm now aged 55. I worked there for 25 years before embarking on my own career. And I witnessed really something quite remarkable happen. An organization that didn't know the limits, that was prepared to do things other organizations weren't prepared to do. And I worked for a company which the boss of, a man called uh, Sir Richard Branson, started the company when he was 15 years old. And what I'm going to tell you today is the story of that company and how did the man that brought the world punk rock end up building the world's first commercial spaceship. I think one of the things that's interesting to me is as I, when I was a kid growing up in Britain, I really loved Virgin. As a teenager, I loved the kind of music that they were signing, uh, bands like Boy George, uh, the Sex Pistols. And I, when I was at university, actually wanted to know how Virgin worked. And when I did economics and history at university, I used to spend a lot of time reading up on what was happening to this young company I was witnessing. So I learned quite a lot about the business before I eventually end up, ended up working there. One of the interesting things that I noticed was that <clears throat> the company clearly had no fear of failure. Now, one of the reasons for that is that it was started by a young man aged 15, and he started it when he was still at school, at a time in Britain when people did not start businesses. Britain was not very entrepreneurial in the, early in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Business was not the thing. It was very entrepreneurial of you in the music business, but not many others. And lo and behold, this young man started his business in the music arena. Having started a student magazine at the age of uh, 15, he went on to found a record company at the age of 18. Now, there was very little written about Virgin in those days, so I did some research when I eventually joined the company in 1985. And Richard Branson had done an interview at the age of 18 to explain to Vogue magazine, a very well-known global magazine, who were doing a series of articles on young people and what they were doing in Britain. And he was chosen as one of the people. And he wrote, to, he wrote in this article about why he was calling this new company Virgin. Now, at the age of 18, this young lad said, we decided to call the company Virgin Records and not Slipped Disc Records because I said to my cousin Simon, you couldn't put the name Slipped Disc on the back of an aeroplane and one day I'd like to go into the airline business. In fact, one day I'd like to do lots of different things for young people and Virgin's a sexy name and we're all virgins in business with no experience and we think it's a name we can apply to lots of different things we're going to do for young people in the future. Now that's very visionary and he was actually a young man who although he didn't know at the time, had attention deficit hyperactive disorder. We treat that these days, but in those days they didn't even really know what it was. He was called dyslexic. And interestingly enough, when he left school at the age of 15, his headmaster at school said, Richard, within three years you're either going to go to prison or become a millionaire. Anyway, within three years he had gone to prison and become a millionaire. So that's the measure of how this company Virgin started. It started with a young man with no fear of failure. He just wanted to go out and do things. And they were very lucky. And luck is a big thing in business, as you all know. You always need a little bit of luck, but you have to plan around your luck when you get it. The luck they got was that they signed a young man called Mike Oldfield, who wrote an album of um, basically orchestral rock music called Tubular Bells. 
Now, Tubular Bells went on to become the biggest selling album of the 1970s, and it went on to become uh, the theme music for a new genre of horror movie, the first of which was called The Exorcist, and it was the theme music in that film. And it made them a lot of money, and they decided to do lots of different things in business. Now, this was the original logo of Virgin that you see behind you. And in 1977, Sir Richard Branson, or Richard Branson, he was then, went into a club in London, and he signed the world's first punk band called the Sex Pistols, you might remember the name of. And that was the beginning of a new era of music that began in Britain and ended up in bands like Boy George and Culture Club and Simple Minds and a whole lot of other music of that era. But they were the first of these type of bands. Now, Richard Branson's cousin, who was actually the golden ears of Virgin Records, as it had become already, Simon Draper, thought the band were terrible. Richard Branson thought the band were wonderful because he was tone deaf and he couldn't actually hear what they were singing. And he went on and signed them and they became very successful. But they refused to use this logo because it was too hippie. So to mark out the kind of person Richard was and the kind of entrepreneurial spirit that Virgin has, he went to look for a new logo, the logo that became famous around the world on all sorts of different businesses eventually. And it's interesting, that logo took 10 minutes to design. In 1977, just having signed the Sex Pistols, he just, he, Johnny Rotten, who was the lead singer of the Sex Pistols, said, we need a new logo to go on our new record. We're not going to use that hippie logo. So Richard Branson asked a designer to come to his office, which was on a houseboat in London on a canal. And the designer sat down with his iPad of that time, which was a felt-tip pen and paper, and he sat down, and Richard Branson described how he wanted to use the name Virgin to do all sorts of different things for young people. He would be in all sorts of different businesses one day. At the moment, he was just in the music business, but one day he might even have an airline, and he wanted a, a, a logo that could go on the telephone. As he was speaking, the designer sc scrawled the name Virgin, as you see it there on the bit of paper. Richard reached over the desk and said, that's the logo, that's great, thank you very much. And that was how one of the world's most famous brands came to be. Anyway, <clears throat> the Virgin I joined was beginning to grow. It hadn't grown to quite this extent, but the idea of it had. Richard had this idea that he would start lots of businesses and manage them all separately with different partners. Some of them one day he might quote on a stock market, some would be with a trade partner, such as another airline or a railway company or a media company, and some would be with just debt investment and bankers. But he would basically set up a kind of what we called, when I started to work at Virgin, the branded venture capital model. By the time I joined Virgin, the only other business that had really got going was the airline. Now, I really wanted to work for this company. But when, as happens in life sometimes, and chance that happens in life, I was actually approached to go and work there by coincidence. And the reason I wanted to work there was because not only did I admire the idea of the entrepreneurialism of the company, but I admired the sheer bravado of the individual who was running it. I remember I was a graduate trainee in 1984 when Richard Branson started his airline, and I was working in a, a branch of the travel agency of Thomas Cook, and I was selling airline tickets. And on the week that Virgin Atlantic launched, the marketing magazine of Britain called Marketing Week came around our office, and I was reading through it, and there was a big article saying why Virgin Atlantic will fail. And it was by the editor of Marketing Week. And Marketing Week had done some market research, and they had decided Virgin Atlantic would fail because only 9% of adults in Britain would be prepared to fly on an airline run by a record company called Virgin. And that seemed a very damning conclusion and very logical. But having studied economics and knowing a little bit about research, I thought to myself, well, that's not very good research because nobody knows about Virgin being in the airline business yet, so surely you can't draw any conclusions at this stage. And it's more about what it does than the name. Anyway, the very next week, this dyslexic entrepreneur with his attention deficit disorder writes an article for the same magazine. And this is one of the main reasons I really wanted to work for Virgin. And he says, congratulations, Marketing Week. I've done no research on the Virgin name in the airline business. I've only researched what customers want. All I care about is what they want, and they're not getting what they want at the moment. And by the way, I've only got one aeroplane, 
So 9% of the British public is 27,000 years' worth of customers. <laughs> I thought, when I read that, not only did I burst out laughing, but I thought, I have to work for this person. And luckily enough, two years later, I got approached to work there, and I joined the airline in the very early days. Now, one of the things about Richard Branson is that he's thirsty for knowledge as an individual. He's always wanting to know. I think it's because he had quite a difficult education when he was young, because he was dyslexic. But he's fiercely intelligent, and he always wants to know what people think. He doesn't really care so much about what he thinks. He wants to know what people think. And that is the mark of not only a great entrepreneur, but a business that's going to go places. If you're going to go places in business, you have to know what people think. You don't just tell them what you think. And I was lucky enough when I started working there to go to a meeting with a man called Sir Freddie Laker, who very few of you will have heard of. But he was actually the grandfather of all airline entrepreneurs. All the great airline entrepreneurs who've changed this business, like Stelios Hadjianu, EasyJet, Sir Richard Branson at Virgin, Herb Kelleher in America. He is the kind of person that they all worship at the altar of, because he was the first real modern airline entrepreneur. And he founded a company called Laker Skytrain that was flying across the Atlantic and was put out of business by a cartel of British Airways, Air France, Pan Am, and a couple of other big airlines at the time in the early 1980s. And Sir Richard Branson got Freddie Laker in to our offices, and he forensically examined all the reasons why Freddie had gone bust. And Freddie said, I made a big mistake, Richard. If you're up against cartels and monopolies, and often when you're starting out in business you are, you have to learn to do a number of things. One, you have to learn to do the things you're good at and outsource the things that you're not good at. Well, there's a lesson that's been learned since. Secondly, he said, you've got to combine quality in your business and value for money. If Virgin wants to make it as a brand around the world, it's got to combine quality, value for money, have a sense of ideals, be uber competitive, being seen as the public as acting in their interests, and you've got to become famous as well, because you've got to be at the head of this business as it takes on the government monopoly in aviation around the world. He said, if you do all those things, you won't go bust, you'll survive. And he said, and by the way, when BA come after you, which they inevitably will, shout long, shout hard, and then sue the bastards. So all of that advice was taken on board, including the very last bit of advice. I'll tell you about that a bit later. But anyway, that was the, really one of the first lessons I learned in business. The simplest lesson of all, that quality and value for money go hand to hand in the eyes of people, and they should go hand to hand in the eyes of a business. You've got to give the best value with the best quality combined. If you can bring the two together in that magic circle, then you have got a very successful business on your hands. Now, over the next few years, Virgin went on to do lots of things. And we learned not to fail, basically because of the fact that we were prepared to take the risk to fail. And we learned how to manage risk. It's such an important thing to do. We ended up doing so many exciting things. We built the airline business around the world with an airline in Australia, an airline in the United States, and Virgin Atlantic, a long-haul airline in the UK. We also went into other businesses, the media business, the banking business, a number of other things. And one business we went into, which I want to talk about today, was the train business. Not the most exciting business in the world, but one of the things that Richard Branson realized was that if we were going to make a success of Virgin as a brand, we should be seen as being the best at something. And it was possible in the UK in the 1990s to be the best at something, because what had happened before was very bad. The railways have been run as a state monopoly since the Second World War, a company called British Rail. And it had been starved of funds by the government. And at the time in Britain, there were 40-year-old trains running around and 40-year-old track that had not been upgraded. So we embarked on a plan to transform the railways, a business that would have been the least one anybody would have expected. But it actually fitted in with Virgin having a long-haul airline. And in Britain, we weren't going to enter the airline market, so we decided to enter the rail market. And we designed a brand new train. We took over, we took over a privatized part of the railway, running the main trains up to Scotland. And we built a plan. Now, it was the toughest thing, one of the toughest things Virgin did, because we had to take over very old trains and very old track. But we worked out a 15-year plan to transform the business. This basically was the plan. <clears throat> the plan was we would have no growth for the first five years, but we would run the company profitably. During that five years, we would build an entirely new fleet of trains and upgrade the track. 
And while we were preparing to do that, we would bring in a lot of technological innovation that had never been seen in the railways. We were the first company to introduce online ticketing, the very first in the world. We were the first one to have um, seat back entertainment in a train. And we were the very first one to introduce Wi-Fi on board. We had Wi-Fi on these trains from 2005 when they went into service. And we also designed a new tilting train called the Pendolino that operates now on the West Coast Main Line. And <clears throat> in the second part, the next 10 years of the franchise from the government, we more than doubled the number of people traveling on it. In fact, today, there are 35 million people traveling on that railway. And it's actually been the fastest growing railway in Europe over the last 15 years. And it's also profitable, not only for the government and the public, the taxpayer gets money back from it, and the shareholders do well as well. It's been a big success story. And it's been based around not only a vision at the beginning, we can do this better, but also a solid plan based on researching what, public, what the public would want and thinking ahead to the future. And it's meant that Virgin has become a very successful company in the railway industry in Britain generally. Now, <clears throat> one of the things, and one of the things I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this morning, is why did the company, having become very successful, so by the time we get to the middle of the 2000s, about 2005, Virgin is a company with about 60,000 people working for the different Virgin businesses. The different businesses, some of them are quoted on the stock market, some of them are privately held, some of them are joint ventures. But from a company I joined, which had 240 employees, it had grown to about 60,000. And Sir Richard Branson had become a multi-billionaire, but still worked in the business as he does to this day, and is passionate about the business as he is to this day. But in this period of time, we decided to look at the space industry. Partly because we'd learned a lot about the aviation industry, and we'd learned a lot about the new technologies in it. And we realized that the government monopoly of space was one that was holding back the development of space industrially. There are so many things we could be doing in space we don't do now, because it's too expensive to get the equipment there. But the equipment is capable of working up in space, producing solar power, or having server farms in space is perfectly feasible. But the only problem that holds them back is the cost of the ancient rocketry that we use. Every time the shuttle flew in its last few years, it was costing up to $2 billion a launch for each time the shuttle launched, let alone the cost of developing it. And we were lucky in that one day we saw a project called Spaceship One, which was being built by Paul Allen to uh, win the X Prize, which is a private prize in America of $10 million to be the first ever private spaceship to fly. We saw this project because we were working on another project at the same factory. If I go back a slide or two, we were working on building a plane made out of carbon composite that could fly around the world on one tank of fuel. And uh, <clears throat> when we were in the factory, we saw this little test spaceship being built. And I realized the economics of it the man who was building it for us told us that the patron of it, Paul Allen, was spending about $30 million building it, and it would take two people to space. So I went outside, and I phoned my boss, Sir Richard Branson. I said, swear word, swear word, I can't use it at the Aspire conference, Richard. He's building a swear word spaceship. I swear word you not. Swear word the global flyer plane. We need to get one of these. And he basically, on the spot, said, who owns the rights to it? And I said, uh, Paul Allen, the ex-Microsoft boss. And he said, go and see Paul. I'll phone him. Go and see him in Seattle and offer him $2 million up front to buy the rights commercially because he won't want to develop it commercially, I'm sure. That's sure enough what I did. I sat outside his office in Seattle in a place called the Vulcan Fund for two weeks. Eventually, we got a meeting and we bought the rights to this technology that was being developed to fly people into space in 2004. And we did a lot of research. And we found out that there had been space planes in the past. The X-15 flew into space 200 times for the US government, very economically efficiently. But its materials technology in the 60s was not yet ready for commercial exploitation. It eventually became the foundations of the stealth fighter. And NASA abandoned their involvement in this and went on to build the Apollo rockets to go to the moon. So there was lots of precedent for space planes. They just 
basically history had left them behind and the engineers had forgotten about them. But new technology of carbon composites and new types of engines meant you could now build something that would work. And we did a lot more research. And we found out that the little test spaceship could be built out using our global flyer design for our plane to go around the world into a very big system. And we researched people. And we found out that there were 150,000 people around the world who'd like to fly to space for $200,000 and could afford to do it. A company called Futron had done the research. And we also found out that there were plenty of people who wanted to launch satellites, but they were too expensive to launch. But the satellites were coming down in price dramatically. So we realized if we built a big enough system, we could become a satellite launch company, a space tourism company, and a space science company, and we could build a business plan that could become profitable. Now, that's where many companies would just stop and you know, take a tablet and go to sleep. But we went and did it. And it was an amazing project to work on. I was actually in the process of leaving Virgin. And I agreed to stay part time to get this spaceship built and began my non exec exterior career at the same time. And we built it over the following five years. This is the finished system. There's actually a story behind that logo you see underneath it. On the very first day we flew, I was in Washington, D.C talking to the US government and the Federal Aviation Authority about the test program that was about to start, and then had indeed started. And I was in the middle of a meeting with the head of the Federal Aviation Authority, and I get this phone call again. It was Richard on the phone. Swear word, swear word, I can't use it at the Aspire conference, swear word. Where's the swear word logo on the bottom of my spaceship? Because I'd forgotten to put the logo underneath for the first test flight. So 24 hours later, we had that logo instead underneath it, and it was all painted up beautifully. But that, again, is the mark of somebody who understands a brand and understands marketing. And the project went on. I actually left the project at this time, and it went on to complete test flying. And then, last October, it had an accident. It was pilot error, as it'll turn out. The report's about to come out. Um, it was not due to the system. And the amazing thing about Virgin is even that has not caused the company to even blink. They were already building the second spaceship, which will be completed in a few weeks' time, and they've already got permission to go back into test flying, as it wasn't a mechanical system failure, and they are confident they will begin commercial flight next year. Now, one of the, things, one of the last things I did when I was working on this project for Virgin is built a spaceport, as you do. Um, and we built a spaceport that was quite unique. We decided that if it was going to be a spaceport that was going to really work commercially for the state of New Mexico where it was built, it had to be one whereby the public could engage in what was happening and the customers. So it was designed with a geodesic roof structure that allowed the spaceships to come in right underneath it. And you can look down and see them being serviced through the glass floors. And you can participate in the training and the maintenance and everything and the public can actually get involved in the project and see what's going on. Very open access. It's, uh, it's, it's a bit like taking the idea of open access in IT and applying it to a physical building so that people can access and see. And actually, even although the spaceport hasn't officially opened yet, in the sense of there aren't regular space flights yet, there's only test flights going on, it's still become one of the biggest tourist attractions in New Mexico. And there's a funny thing. When the state of New Mexico was deciding to build this spaceport and they were looking at me to get help with the business plan for it, they were sitting there and they said, well, well Mr. Whitehorn, we reckon about 20,000 people a year might come to this spaceport. Uh, you know, there'll be the people who are flying on the spaceships, there'll be the scientists, there'll be the people launching satellites, there'll be their families, a few tourists might come. He said, uh, that's the number we were given to the government for how many people are going to come. And I said, how did you get to this number? He said, well, we just added up all those people that you said are going to be using it commercially. I said, but what about the excitement of space flight and the general public? And they said, well, we, we don't know about that. We don't know how many people might come. I said, well, you know what? I said, 200 miles away from this spaceport, there's a place called Roswell, New Mexico. And in this place called Roswell, New Mexico, they get half a million visitors a year to look at a plastic alien in a pub. 
So I think we can do better than 20,000. Sure enough, they've already had 200,000 visitors to this and it hasn't even opened yet. Anyway, <clears throat> that was my last project for Virgin. I had gone part-time. But it's funny in life, I took a lot of lessons out of the things I did at Virgin. And they almost began to apply straight away. One of them was I got approached by some people in Glasgow in Scotland who were building a massive new entertainment center called the Hydro. And the architect who was starting the design of it had been the architect who designed this, Foster's in London, a very famous architectural firm. And they had recommended that I might be a good non-executive director of this new business being set up and I could help them get it built. And sure enough, the same precepts applied. This fear of failure. So everybody was scared that could you make a 12,000 seat indoor arena work in Glasgow? Could you raise the money? Could you do this? Could you do that? So I worked with them and we worked on the approach of researching. And we researched the area around Glasgow and found out that the Scots, as you won't be surprised to hear, spend more money on live entertainment than any other people in Europe. You'll also realize that London has a big centre called the O2, which has been a massive success in the previous 10 years, but there was nowhere really north of London. So putting one in Glasgow with its big hinterland of people who love to go out and party made a lot of sense. If we could design it right, we could build a 12,000 seat arena that could be the envy of the world using this same roof design, geodesic, with no pillars. The roof design allowed us to get the spaceship in underneath was the same roof design that could allow you to get 12,000 people in, looking at the artists playing very successfully without having to look behind pillars. And that's precisely what we did. I'll just move on. This is, this is the SSE Hydro. Now, the SSE Hydro um, is now the world's second busiest live entertainment venue, indoor live entertainment venue. It's just overtaken Madison Square Gardens. It opened around the same time as this center, and over a million and a half people have been through it in the last year and a half. And it's taken the business that I am now chairman of, I started as an exec, it's taken the business from producing 200,000 pounds of EBITDA, about 300,000 euros of EBITDA a year, to this year it will produce 12 million euros of EBITDA in the space of 20 months. That's how transformational it's been. And having the vision to put this in the middle of Glasgow. And actually, they call it the spaceship there now, which is rather nice. Um, and uh, it's right, uh, the centre of Glasgow is just down here off the map. This is just outside the centre. And it has had such a transformational effect. It's actually turned Glasgow into a super media hub in the space of two years. It's had that big an effect on the place. Now, the other project I'm working on since I left Virgin, to which some of the same ideas apply that we've talked about, is one I'm doing for the British government. And it's this. Uh, you've heard of the Google pod in San Francisco, the driverless car. Well, we have just unveiled the same thing in the UK. This is happening in Milton Keynes as I speak. Uh, we've built three of these in the last year. I'm chairman of a thing called the Transport Systems Catapult. And I am there to help British companies design new ideas in transportation. Intelligent mobility is what we call it. Robotics being introduced into ground and air transport. And this is our first big project. And uh, it, it's literally starting to drive on the streets of Milton Keynes in England in the next few weeks. And will be the basis of a way to take people around, um, basically combine the concept of Uber, which no doubt many of you have heard of, uh, which is a way to book taxis, combine that with driverless vehicles, and you've got a much more intelligent mobility for the future. And for Britain, that really matters, because again, if you do research, we know we've got a massively aging population. I sit on the board of one of Britain's biggest transport companies, Stagecoach, who run buses and trains. And we can see in the demographics of what's happening now in our country, the number of old people driving is growing rapidly, and the accident rate is starting to go up as a result of it. So the more we can introduce easy technologies that allow people to continue to be mobile in our aging population, the better it's going to be for our society. So this is a great project. This is one that has a business plan, but it's based upon around the state intervening to get the thing kicked off. So our catapult, as we call it in Britain for transport, is an innovation center which uses some government money to help kickstart private sector projects. 
So just going back, that's what I've done since I left Virgin. And uh, I left Virgin in 2010. Now, one of the lessons I took out, which I think is very applicable to the kind of work that you all do, I took out of the space project. When we finished the spaceship on time and to budget, one of the reasons we succeeded in doing that was that we were a very tight team. There were 46 of us who built the spaceship. And the 46 of us managed about 800 outsourced contractors to get it done. And because we were a very tight team, and I took responsibility for dealing with the shareholder and the money people directly, and didn't have to worry them about that, and we could communicate very easily, everything came together very well. Now, we followed a set of rules. Now, normally, when you're looking at anything new, it's always the latest idea, the latest idea from the latest entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. But when I looked at how to get this thing built using its new technology materials, I went way back in time. And I found out that in 1946, Lockheed Martin set up a company, which some of you might have heard of it, called Skunk Works, very famous name in terms of innovation and development of businesses and in technology development. And Skunk Works was set up by an engineer called Kelly. And he set 14 rules for how to do a difficult technology project. They were called Kelly's Rules. And Kelly wrote them in 1946 and applied them to what he did. And actually, you can still to this day Google them. I, when I found them, originally hadn't Googled them because I didn't know what they were called. I was just researching the history of doing difficult aviation projects and found skunk works. But they're well worth looking at because not all of them would ever apply to any project management you do, but some of them do. And the most important one is how you manage a team and keeping it small and keeping it tight when you're trying to do a difficult project. And actually, all the big IT projects that have failed in the United Kingdom, for example, we've had a huge failure of an NHS project. And it turned out that managing this new IT project for the National Health Service in Britain involved 27,000 people being involved in the decision-making process out of a total number of NHS or National Health Service employees of 200,000. One in 10 of them got involved in the project, and it failed. So whenever you do a project, and you'll be doing lots of them with the kind of growth of the business you've got here in Krakow, remember to keep it tight and keep it based upon research. But do have dream and vision. And don't always shoot the messengers. If you think something's failing in it, act. But that doesn't mean to say you stop what you're doing. Learn to manage risk, and anything can be done, and the world is your oyster. Thank you for your time.